Good morning and welcome to the second part of uh, my talk on Hebrews. Now, if you listened to me last week, you'll know I set you a couple of challenges and I wonder how you've got on with them. Um, what I would say is that whenever I give a talk, God usually reminds me of something in the talk. And a couple of days after I did the talk, um, one of my children, Robin, was, was taken ill and um, and you had to go for a covid test etc etc and all of you who are parents will know that the second your child is ill you go into a major panic where's the cowpole the fact that uh, my kids are old enough to have children of their own is completely irrelevant um you know you're always a child aren't you uh, to your mum um and as it turns out the, the covid was negative and all was well but god just reminded me and said um do you listen to yourself last week then, Jackie? It's all about trust, you know. And uh, I thought, mm hmm. It, trusting God with your children is perhaps uh, one of the hardest things to do. Um, so I wondered how you'd all got on. Don't worry, I can't see your faces from here. Um, so this week we are going to look at Hebrews 4 uh, the vital importance of Jesus again, and the concept of rest. Now, in verse 1, it says, God's promise of rest still stands. Now, we know the Israelites missed out uh, because of their lack of faith. And, and there's a real warning in that, of course. But actually, there is a rest for all of us promised. And what does this rest actually look like? Well, God rested after creation, didn't he? Um, and there's that wonderful ending to C.S. Lewis's Narnia stories. The term is over, the holidays have begun, the dream is ended, this is the morning. I love that. I want that on my headstone. Um, obviously rest is peace after struggles and, and effort, but actually rest in this sense means an awful lot more than that. It means definitely freedom from the laws, really, that Moses had instigated, uh, obedient to God. Um, freedom of worship, freedom to be who you really are, and free to be in the presence of God forever. Now, the writer is very anxious that his listeners don't miss out on this. There are no halfway measures. There won't be a bit of rest. It's all or nothing, he says. And he goes on to say in verse 11, so let us do our best to enter that rest. So what does that require? First of all, obedience to the word of God. Remember Moses, who didn't obey the instructions of God right at the last moment? He was told, as I said last week, to speak over the rock to get water, but instead he decided to do what he'd done before uh, and whack it. And sometimes we don't take the word of God seriously, do we? Um, it contains all that we need to know. There are commands, warnings, directives, illustrations, and it's got power. How many times have you sort of sat and listened to somebody talking in church um, and he's, he or she has, has mentioned a particular verse and you think, oh, that is absolutely for me. That's God speaking directly to me and into my situation. Um, and that's the personal touch of God's word. It exposes, doesn't it, all our hidden parts. And most of all, it makes us accountable. Oh, we're quite keen on that word, accountable, aren't we, in society? Something dreadful happens and we all say, well, somebody must be accountable for this. As long as it's not us. Um, as an elder of Riverside, I will be accountable to God for that role. Um, James, uh, in chapter 3, verse 1, says... For we who teach will be judged more strictly. And that's not a comfortable thought at three o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I can tell you because God is both love and righteousness. 
However uncomfortable that sounds to us, we will be accountable. God expects things of us, just as we expect things of our children. How many times those of your parents have tried to drill in the please and thank you rule to your kids and they go to somebody's house and miraculously they remember and you think, yes, they've got it. And the next time they go somewhere, it's, it's a shambles again. Um, because we fail, don't we? God expects much of us and we let him down, we fail. But all is not lost, of course. This is the good bit. Because we have Jesus. He says in verse 14 of Hebrews 4, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. Now, Jewish Christians perfectly understood the role of a high priest. Moses had laid down all the rules as given by God. But Jesus, as the high priest, it's something different. He is the only one who is called great. He is the only one who has entered heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father, he is the only one who is the Son of God. A high priest was responsible for the sacrifices of animals to God as laid out in the Torah. But Jesus was the sacrifice. And because of this, he alone can mediate between us and the Father. So the writer says, hold firmly. Because we have someone on our side all the way through the trials and difficulties of this world. In addition, of course, Jesus was a man who, in verse 15, it says, understands our weaknesses. An alternative translation for the Greek word is actually suffers along with, and I actually like that rather better. As a man, Jesus was tempted, experienced exasperation, exhaustion, fear, but unlike us, no sin. And of course, that's the key to the gospel. He was the only answer to sin, obedient, Faithful, trusting, loving. All the things we wrestle with on a daily basis. And because of Christ, we can, as it says in Hebrews, come boldly to the throne. Ancient Jewish rabbis thought that God actually had two thrones, one of mercy and one of judgment. But because of Christ, there's really only one, grace. And what a comfort in knowing that Christ sits by the Father and speaks for each one of us. On a much simpler level, it's a bit like having your big brother sticking up for you to your dad when you're in trouble. I'm an only child, so I had to have imaginary friends, but you get the point. And at the end, it says, there we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Rather like the old hymn I remember my granddad playing and I sang as a child. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Now, I have no doubt that some of you listening to me will be singing that song in your head and it's on YouTube. It's still a great song. And that's the presence of God. That's the rest we are promised because of Jesus. The Jesus who mediates for us, who speaks for us, who understands our weaknesses and who walks alongside us. So, new challenges this week. 
Daryl reminded us last week that life is short. But remember where you're going. What rest awaits us if we are obedient and faithful. And secondly, let's try and practice that rest. Being in the presence of God in the here and now. In all the busyness of life, in all the unknowns and the confusion, let's try and spend more time resting in God. I'm going to leave you with the very familiar words of Philippians 4, verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. God bless.